And he actually <laughs> blew someone up on the toilet once. <laughs> you know, a lot of you young rock and roll musicians are going to be big stars someday. Just like Keith here. Everything you've ever heard about Keith Moon is true. And then he'll just go... Bah, 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 bah. It's true genius what he's doing. Bing, 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 bing. There was never anybody like him before him, and there's been nobody like him since. The drums to him were more of a lead instrument. Keith Moon was the drummer for the legendary rock band The Who. His style behind the kit was unconventional and explosive, and he had a reputation for being one of the most eccentric people in rock history. From blowing up drum sets, destroying hotel rooms, and his over-the-top pranks, Keith Moon truly earned his nickname, Moon the Loon. Keith Moon was one of the earliest rock drummers to use a double bass kit, and one of the key figures responsible for bringing drummers out of the background into the spotlight. He was inducted into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame and voted one of Rolling Stone's greatest drummers in history. Join us as we dive into the genius of Keith Moon. In the mid-60s, when The Who exploded onto the scene, rock music was in its infancy. The bands of this era typically had drummers playing a background role, keeping time without wandering too far into the spotlight. But this wasn't the position that Keith Moon would be contained by. His style can be seen as more of an assault on the drums rather than just playing them in a traditional manner. Some of you might be familiar with the 1963 surf rock classic, Wipeout by the Safaris. So two years after that song came out, we hear Keith Moon playing something similar with The Who on The Ox, but way more over the top. Before filming this video, I posted on social media asking drummers to share their favorite Keith Moon drum parts. Rock legends like Brad Wilk from Rage Against the Machine and Todd Zuckerman from Styx chimed in with the same suggestion where we can hear Keith leading with his kick drum. The thing about Keith Moon, he was the first drummer that I ever heard do drum fills and do crashes, crashing the ride. And, and crashing his cymbals in between fills. Now you need a lot of drums to do that, but the drums to him were more of a lead instrument. You know I think you do. I have been born in some prison water knows my scream. Keith Moon wasn't just about over-the-top energy, even though this was a recognizable part of his sound and approach. One of the reasons his playing had such an impact live and on the records is because he was a master of playing with dynamics. He was the energy of The Who. And without that drumming, The Who would not have had that energetic sound. Keith's sound on the drums was instantly recognizable. This was true especially for his drum fills. When you hear a Keith Moon drum fill, you know exactly who played it right from the first note. The way he phrases his roles and how he plays his accents, his style was uniquely his own. Keith would sometimes set up a new section of a song with a super dense drum fill, not something you would typically hear, especially in the early 70s. His explosive drum fills added a ton of energy to The Who's music. Even in their earlier songs, this was an integral part of the band's sound. And he wouldn't keep a really traditional beat, and he would use the whole drum set as a, more of a sonic assault all over the place. Never played the same thing twice. And I think The Who was probably one of the most exciting 
in their heyday rock bands of all time. Where some drummers would need several bars or an extended break to make a statement with their drum fills, that just wasn't the case with Keith Moon. This is what he could do with just one bar of time. What he wouldn't do is play boom, boom, ba, ba, boom, ba, boom, boom, you know, boom, 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 Because Keith Moon is so well known for his over-the-top drum fills and explosive style of drumming, his groove playing often gets overlooked. There's tons of great moments in the Who's catalog where Keith lays down simple and tasteful grooves, like his 16th note hi-hat groove in Love Is Coming Down. Todd Zuckerman describes Keith Moon's pocket in his own words, it bugs me out when someone says that Keith Moon didn't groove, but they're wrong. There were tons of songs where Keith laid down a great groove, Join Together, Put the Money Down, and Relay, for example. Keith's driving and frantic feel was truly ahead of its time, as we can hear on the track Baby Don't You Do It. The track opens up with an irregular kick and snare pattern at a tempo that makes it feel almost like a breakbeat groove. And eventually, Keith pulls out all the stops where his improvised grooves turn into a full-blown drum solo. I go down to the river And I'll be Going to ride him in Don't see about me In the track I'm One, Keith lays down a funky groove that's decorated with classic Keith Moon triplets. Speaking of triplets, he also uses them in The Rock, which features a driving march feel. And this eventually progresses into a slower 6-8 feel, where we can hear Keith reference the triplet roughs from earlier in the song. A lot of people really, really, really uh, have never understood uh, how important Keith's drum in style was to the Who. And I, and I kind of pictorially describe it as if you imagine uh, Pete and John as two knitting needles and Keith was the ball of wool. He would kind of keep it all together and, and with the vocals on top it would produce a product. He took Keith out of it and it was just like... Now, if there's one thing that should be obvious by now, it's that Keith Moon unapologetically did things his own way. One of the more bizarre things he experimented with in his career was abandoning the hi-hats altogether. Kenny Jones, the drummer who took over for him in The Who after Keith passed, had this to say about his hi-hat playing. I think a hi-hat restricted Keith. I think he felt trapped by it, and if it was included in the setup, he would have to play a certain way. But if it wasn't there, he could be more expressive. Here's an example of Keith's no hi-hats phase live in 1970. 
The track Go To The Mirror opens up with a hi-hat groove on the record, but Keith makes it sound perfectly fitting without them when he played it live. He seems to be completely Keith employed this kind of restraint in more ways than just choosing gear. A more strange example of this can be found in the track Going Mobile. Here, Keith swaps back and forth from a full groove to only using the kick and snare in a section, where the vast majority of drummers would choose to just play straight through. Eliminating cymbals to create unique sounding grooves is a tactic Keith used quite often. In the outro of New Song, there's a great example of this where he lays down a funky kick and snare groove with a single China hit added to each bar. Also on Sister Disco, we hear something similar, this time with a tom groove that features one China hit in each bar as the only symbols in this entire section. Goodbye, Sister Disco. My dance has left you behind. On the opposite end of the spectrum, Keith had plenty of tricks up his sleeve when it came to cleverly adding tons of drums into his parts. Check out what Todd Zuckerman had to say about the track I Can See For Miles. I Can See For Miles was the hit single off of Sell Out and was a defining psychedelic song of the era. Keith double tracked his drums with two takes. Listen as you can hear them split in stereo. Now even when Keith wasn't double tracking drums, he still found ways to create unconventional and unique drum parts, like in the song Armenia City in the Sky. If you ever want to lose some time, just take off. The way he did this was integral to the success of The Who. Take tracks like Out in the Streets and Glittering Girl, for example. The busier grooves that Keith would play on these tracks would probably be considered more of a drum fill for most other drummers, but this was just standard Keith Moon. Out in the street. Speaking of busier drum parts, we can't forget about one of the most famous Who songs, Pinball Wizard. He stands like a statue, becomes part of the machine. Me and all the bumpers always play free. Plays by intuition, the digit counters fall. That death number's life is show up, plays a mean pinball. It's definitely unusual to hear a song like this that got so much radio play, just avoid any kind of standard rock drumming altogether. This perfectly demonstrates what Keith Moon brought to the table with The Who and why he's become such an influential figure in the drumming world. He'll play a long dead rhythm, and then he'll just go blah, 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 in with the vocal, and it's, it, it's true genius what he's doing. Keith played rock drums with a spirit closer to jazz drummers in that he accented and accompanied what was happening musically in a more expressive way. Because of this, the interaction between the band members of The Who was different from other bands. Pete Townsend was very aware of this. Keith's style was derived from jazz, I think, and yet he found it very hard to swing in a jazz manner. His playing was always on the beat, driving, moving forward. Keith decorated as he played, he punctuated and marked music events like an orchestral drummer. Some of his fills were incredibly complex, but undisciplined, and they didn't always come off. But his playing was also humorous. Max Weinberg once said that Keith Moon was a groundbreaking drummer. He was as influential in the 60s as Gene Krupa was in the 30s. Moon was very dynamic and, in my view, was the lead instrument in The Who, which is an unusual situation. 
His improvisational way of playing drums forced bassist John Entwistle to take on the role of primary timekeeper in many of the band's songs. Carl Palmer put it like this, the thing is, Keith wasn't a great drummer with technique, let's be honest. What Keith was, was a completely original drummer, and when someone is a completely original drummer, that is a great drummer. He made the Who work. He didn't need to keep time, this wasn't his game. He had Entwistle to do that. As the song Won't Get Fooled Again builds in intensity, we don't get a single bar of standard timekeeping from Keith Moon. We hear solid eighth notes on the bass drum and non-stop drum fills in and out of the band shots. Another interesting aspect of Keith Moon's playing was his sensitivity to the vocals. On a casual listen, you might think that his fills were random and overplayed, since it's typically unusual to hear drum fills anywhere other than the end of a phrase. But if you pay close attention, he's almost always following something that's happening vocally or within one of the other instrument parts. Roger Daltrey gives us a great insight into this when he talks about Behind Blue Eyes. Let's have a listen to this. Listen to just Keith and the vocal. And he plays the break pretty straight. We can also hear Keith jamming along with the vocals using syncopated fills in tracks like My Wife. One of the staple Keith Moon drum recordings where you can really hear him leading from the drums is The Real Me. Keith starts with fills and embellishments supporting the vocals in the verse, then plays heavy shots and constant rolls around the kit in the chorus section. And on the same album, Keith employs a clever use of a normal rock beat to make the chorus of Cut My Hair more impactful. Even in the sections that are almost free-for-all solos, you still hear Keith Moon interacting with the band. John Marr described it like this. I love to watch the way he rambled around the kit doing oddball drum rolls. And it wasn't random playing at all. I describe Keith Moon's playing as melodic. I think he was very aware of what was going on with Townsend, Entwistle, and Daltrey, especially Daltrey. Keith Moon was far from just someone who sat behind a drum kit and went crazy. The track Drown demonstrates exactly what John is describing here. And off the same album, Keith demonstrates how he can solo over the band shots in The Punk and The Godfather. Okay. I think the word I would use to describe Keith's style of drumming is free rather than anarchic. He knew no boundaries. What was Keith like in 1973? Just a little bit more drunk than he was in 1973. <laughs> Everything you've ever heard about Keith Moon is true. It was in his nature. It was 
quite clear that Keith Moon was certifiably insane and that if he hadn't had a drum kit to play with, he probably would have ended up in jail. The first night that Keith Moon played with us, a pub called the Oldfield Hotel. He broke his drum. He, he smashed up the, the drummer's d drum kit. And I mean, that, that was the start of it. He smashed it up by playing. And aggression, it. I mean, yeah. yeah. It, but the, the, the band immediately became aggressive from that day. In a 1972 interview, Keith gave some insight into what inspired his over-the-top showmanship. In his own words, people like Gene Krupa, Joe Jones, Buddy Rich, the big band drummers, they were the best. I'd see a big band with a double bass drum set up, twirling the sticks, all the theatrics. They're the people I really dug growing up. When you watch footage of Gene Krupa, the influence he had on Keith is clear. The energy they both have is undeniable. Keith Moon once explained, my whole style of drumming changed when I joined The Who. Before, I had just been copying straight from the records, but with The Who, I had to develop a style of my own. I took from Gene Krupa with all the stick twiddling and thought it was great. Gene Krupa was probably his blueprint because Gene Krupa did things that nobody else did either. He was very theatrical. You look at the old things of Gene Krupa, and he's always like Keith Moon developed some kind of style that was so bizarre, he was Gene Krupa. Keith took Gene Krupa's showmanship to an entirely new level. With the facial expressions of a madman and his over-the-top playing style, Keith dominated the stage. This raw theatrical energy is captured perfectly in the promo video for Who Are You? Or in this next clip of I Can't Explain from a 1975 show in Texas, which is full of Keith Moon's crazy arm motions, stick twirls, and not to mention vocals over top of all of it. Or just watch the crazy body movements Keith adds to the big open shots at the end of this clip. Yeah, so when I saw him on the screen with The Kids Are Alright, I, I was blown away by his personality. He, he was just the type of drummer you couldn't take your eyes off of. And he was a big, big influence on me in terms of showmanship and uh, the way he was on, just so commanding on stage, just, you know, bouncing his sticks and, you know, the, the crazy faces. And he was just such a personality. He played drums like a real lead instrument. Live, The Who was a force to be reckoned with and one of the places where Keith shined the most. His chaotic energy made it feel like anything could happen at any moment, which kept the audience on the edge of their seats. In the early 70s, The Who's classic show opener was Heaven and Hell where Keith launched into the song full of energy and never let up. Later on Live at Leeds, the band makes an interesting tempo choice on Summertime Blues. Although the studio version is much faster, here they slow the tempo down, which gives Keith a chance to really open up and throw in tons of triplet drum fills. No cure for the summertime. And only Keith Moon could take a song like Young Man Blues from a mellow blues tune with brushes to pure chaos. At the peak of Love, Rain, Or Me, you can imagine Keith's grinning face and drumming antics as he weaves his way to the finale. He destroys his drum kit and even kicks over his set of chimes at the end of the song. His unique personality extends beyond his drumming style and wild theatrics. In the small handful of Who songs he helped write and record vocals on, we get a peek into his musical creativity. One of his earliest writing credits is on the song I Need You, a song where he also sings lead vocals. This track was originally titled I Need You Like I Need a Hole in the Head, 
and it's about a night that the band met the Beatles at the Ad Lib Club in Soho. He thought they were speaking in a secret language behind his back, and this song was a way of making fun of their British accents. Moon also wrote Cobwebs and Strange, a crazy, accelerating instrumental track. On the Quadrophenia album, Townsend wrote the track Bellboy, and he described it as Moon's theme song on the record. In this track, Keith puts on a Cockney accent, adding a humorous twist that's classic Keith Moon. I'll carry it behind his bleeding little badge. What's his Bellboy? I gotta get running now. Bellboy. No exploration of Keith Moon would be complete without at least touching on his Moon the Loon persona. In Moon's own words about his lunar reputation, I have no real aspirations to be a great drummer. I don't want to channel all my energy into drumming or to be a Buddy Rich. I just want to play drums for The Who, and that's it. I think a lot of my lunacy is because I want to do some film work. Pete has got his writing, John has got his writing and producing, and Roger has his farm. My interest is into filming and videoing. In an unforgettable moment from Rolling Stone's 10th anniversary, Keith and Steve Martin filmed a skit where Keith trashes a hotel room while Steve narrates it as an ad for a hotel for rock stars. You know, a lot of you young rock and roll musicians are going to be big stars someday, just like Keith here. And we know what it's like to be on tour, going from town to town, ending up in some crummy hotel like this one. Let's face it, when you get to your room, the first thing you want to do is Destroy it. But one of the most infamous moments comes from The Who's 1967 performance on the Smothers Brothers. He would put explosives in his drums. You guys were like on the Smothers Brothers or something. <laughs> and you decide, I guess Keith on his own decided he was going to put extra explosives in the drum. And when it went off, it really was like a bomb going off. <laughs> The explosion caused a momentary breakdown in transmission across America. Pete Townsend claimed he was left permanently deaf in one ear, and a flying symbol sliced into Moon's arm. All right, there you have it, the genius of Keith Moon, arguably one of the most unique and important rock drummers in history. I hope this video gave you some new perspectives on Keith Moon, and I hope it inspires you to dive even deeper into his drumming. Now, down in the comments, let me know one thing that you've learned from listening to Keith Moon. And if you're a fan of the Genius Of series, the next episode is on the legendary jazz drummer Art Blakey, so make sure you're subscribed to the channel because you don't want to miss that episode. And also don't forget we have tons of drumless tracks and transcriptions for lots of the songs we've covered in this video over on Drumeo. Just click the link right below this video and you can get a seven day free trial. And with that, thank you so much for watching and I'll see you all in the next video. Cheers. Teenage Wasteland.